disagree. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> she received her master's from Howard University and another master's and a PhD in statistics from Rice University. Her research involves developing statistical models that emphasize the spatial and temporal structure of data and applying them to problems in the environment. She's worked at NASA, the National Security Agency, and the Jet Propulsion Labs, and has partnered with the World Health Organization on research regarding cataract surgical rates in African countries. Both faith and family round out a very busy life that she shares with her husband and three delightful boys. Through her research and work in the community at large, Dr. Will Dr. Williams has helped change the collective mindset regarding STEM in general and math in particular, rebranding the field of mathematics as anything but dry, technical, or male-dominated, but instead a logical, productive career path that is crucial to the future of this country. And so, with no further ado, I would love to ask Dr. Williams to come to the stage. Let's welcome our speaker. everybody. I'm Talithia Williams. I'm really excited to have a chance to talk to you. I'm so glad the students got here. We were waiting. We were like, come on, let's see this great. Um, I'm so glad we finally got you here. Spelman College. Spelman College was the first 
place that I met black women mathematicians. When I applied, I actually applied undecided because I didn't know what I wanted to do uh, as a student. And I had, I had done okay in most subjects. So, well, you know, you know, I was okay in math and I was okay in English and I was okay in social studies. So it wasn't that anything stood out to me. But after I applied to Selma Undecided, they sent me an application for a NASA Women in Science and Engineering Scholarship. And they were like, you should apply to be a wise scholar. And, um, and, and, and my parents, you know, they were working middle class. We didn't have so much money. And so my mama was like, you need to apply to this scholarship because it's a full ride. You know, they just want you to major in one of these things. And I said, yeah. So, so we sat at the kitchen table and I was going down the list. And I, was, I was crossing out the things I did not want to major in. I was like, oh, chemistry? Mm -hmm. No, we're not doing that. Physics? No, not physics. They had all the different engineering. I was like, no, no, no. And I'm crossing out. And my mama said, if you want that money, you better check something on that list. And the only thing I had yet to cross out was math. Because I was about to cross it out. It wasn't like I was like, I love it. I was like, I said, OK, looks like we're not applying. So I checked math, and I applied. And I got the uh, a NASA Y scholarship. Uh, at the time, that program was headed by the late Dr. Etta Faulkner, who's one of my Spelman mentors, and Dr. Sylvia Bozeman, would you stand, my other mentor here at Spelman. And Woo! <laughs> Dr. Yuande, good to see you, Yuande. Yes, yes, so it's so great to see some of my Spelman professors. Um, they're really the reason I went to graduate school, because I was happy with this little bachelor's degree in math. I was like, I can go far in the state of Georgia with a bachelor's degree in math. And um, Dr. Faulkner was the one who encouraged me to go to grad school. Dr. Bozeman uh, was the one who encouraged me to do the EDGE program, which is a program for women going into graduate school in the mathematical sciences. So I did that the summer after my senior year at Spelman. I remember when I was applying to, to graduate school, or even as a student at Spelman, Dr. Faulkner was always like not concerned about the metaphor house. Because I'd be like, Dr. Faulkner, this math is hard, this exam is hard, and oh, abstract algebra, and there's a party. And I can't, like, math is messing up my ability to meet other guys. It's like, it's a lot of work, and it's, you know, we study at the end of the hallway on the weekend, and our friends are out, like, dude, living life. You know, and she's like, don't you worry about those Morehouse men. You can always get a man. She'd be like, don't worry about that. Get your education. And so when I started looking at grad schools, I wanted to go to Cornell because Carlos Castillo Chavez was there. And, uh, and so I said, well, Dr. Faulkner, you know, what do you think about Cornell? They've got supportive faculty. She's like, oh, no, you can't find a husband at Cornell. <laughs> and I'm like, wait a minute, is this the same person who told me not to go across the street because I had homework? And so it was so funny to see her shift. Once it was like, now, now once you start living life, you have to put these other things make them a priority for you as well. So I really appreciated that about her mentorship. I started a PhD program at Howard University in DC. This was uh, theoretical math. I really loved my time at Howard. It was at Howard that I finally took a statistics class. Um, Dr. Washington commented about that earlier. I don't know why, why we didn't want to take Dr. Shaw's class, because she was hard. We couldn't oh. nobody take. We were just like, I got Life is hard enough without a hard stats course. And Dr. Shaw did not play, and it was senior year, and I was just like, I'm just not going to take SADS because it's senior year. And so I did. So I got to Howard, and I took a bio stats. And I was like, I love statistics. This stuff is so amazing. And so later when I saw her, she's like, Timothy, I cannot believe you did not take my statistics. So now we are seven years. So I took a bio stats elective at Howard University, and that was when I fell in love with statistics and data science. I remember. Uh, the class where it happened, I was coming into class, and this was a bio, biostats class that was in the biology department. And so I was like, how hard can it be? It's just like an elective. It's a nice filler to balance out topology and analysis, you know? And our teacher was looking at a data set of, it was mothers, pregnant, pregnant women, who, some of whom had smoked during pregnancy. And so this is just historical data. It wasn't a study or anything like that. And, and then it had data like their ethnicity, the baby's gestation, the birth weight of the baby, whether there were lung complications or not, whether they smoked or not. And so we looked at this data set and I thought, of course, like it's obvious if you smoke while you're pregnant.
that you're going to have low birth weight babies and complications. Like, why are we even, this is obvious. And so the professor said, well, you know, when this data came out, the, t- the, the tobacco industry fought against it. They were like, oh, no, no, it's not nicotine. It's not cigarettes. It's, you know, underlying condition. Like, we, don't, we don't know. It wasn't an experiment. We didn't do a study. This is just an observational data. You can't make a conclusion from observational data. And I remember getting so heated because I was just like, but look at the data. For women who smoke, like they've got 35 week gestations and their babies come out and they're two and three pounds. Like obviously it's the nicotine's the only difference in these two groups. And so that was the moment where I said, oh, I want to study data. I want to understand how people try to lie with data. I want to become an expert so that I can better understand it. Um, so I switched to Rice University in Houston, Texas. I transferred to Rice to get a PhD in statistics. And Rice was very different from Spelman and Howard. I'm sure you can imagine why. Uh, not only, I mean, it was a great institution. I love my time there. But I was the only woman and the only black person in my cohort my year. And so uh, that made for an interesting experience because it was also the first time that I was so aware of my race and my gender in the classroom setting. Like at Spelman, I'd be like, how did you carry the two? I don't even know where that came from. I would just add any question that came to mind, I would just vocalize it. I didn't care if it sounded crazy because I'm around all these women who support me and this professor who, you know, they're not going to go to the that know anything. But at Rice, I was hesitant to ask where the two came from because I thought maybe it's obvious. Did I miss it? What are they going to think that I'm asking the questions? Because I have all these questions and they're just sitting here nodding along and I don't know what's, I'm lost. And so it made me aware that I was in such a safe, supportive space at Spelman and Howard because I didn't, I wasn't, I was so into the math that it it didn't occur to me that I was a black woman who did math. I was just a person who did math. And at at Rice, I was a black woman doing statistics and I was always aware of it. Um, You will soon find out, those of us that have been to graduate school, the only way that you're successful in grad school is that you have a group that you work with. You need folks to do homework with, it's hard, you gotta do qualifying exams, but you just can't go alone. And so I needed to find a way to connect with these other guys who were all different nationalities, Chinese, Russian, white. Like, it was just, they're they're the model UN and I'm over here by myself. And I remember I emailed them the first week of, classes and I said, hey guys, because homework was due Thursdays. We all had the same courses. I said, um, I've reserved the stat library so we can have lunch on Wednesdays and go over homework together. Let me know how many people you can carry in your cars. So that was it. And they they replied back, I don't have a car, can I get a ride? You know, oh I want to go, can we go to McDonald's? No. And so I organized us to to go out to eat, and then we were going to come study and do homework together. So the Monday before, I would do all the homework problems. I'd be like working them out, like oh, okay, you know. And then Wednesday, I'd show up with blank paper and and the board, and I'd be like, hey guys, so let's jump into this. What do you think about number one? And they'd be like, yeah, I don't know. I was like, you know what? Let me just. I just see if I can throw something up there. I don't know. I'm just, it just came to me. It just came to me. And I started, I'm right. So the first two weeks, that's what I did. I organize and I work all the problems and I come in and I pretend. I hope they don't see this. <laughs> I pretend that it was coming off just the top of my head. They were like, wow, oh, so okay, you're good at this. I'm like, it's, a, it's all about the team. It's us. <laughs> Unity, right? By week three, I really didn't know how to complete a problem on my own. I was just like, I don't know. And so I came in week three and I was like, you know what? Chu Han, let, why don't you take it away? I don't want to hog it. It's not about to live yet, you know. But by then we were all uh, acting together. We had a big study group. You know, either you were in this group or you did your own thing, but everybody was working together. So much so, one time it was a problem that we couldn't do. And so I asked about it the next day in class. Because by now I'm used to asking questions because they all know me. They know I'm smart and they think that I am because for two weeks I did all the homework problems off the top of my head. So I asked our professor, I said, you know, can you, can you give me a hint for this one? I couldn't quite get started. 
I know we've turned in our home work, but I'd like to try it. He said, so the why don't you ask your classmates? Maybe they can help you. I was like, oh. So I looked around at my classmates and they were like, actually, you know, if you could answer it, like none of us could get it. So it would be great if you could share because we were all stumped on this one. I wish I had a cell phone. Like I wish I could have just recorded because the expression was just like, oh, oh well, if, well, oh, okay. Well, let, let me give you a hit. But I was like, I was also worthy of the hit by myself, you know. Um, so that was uh, uh, interesting experiences there at Price. This was probably one of the happiest days. This is when I graduated with my PhD. Uh, you see some folks who graduated with me in my cohort. You'll also notice a little bitty bundle of joy. Right there. I was very productive, pushing out PhDs, <laughs> pushing out dissertations, pushing out babies. Uh, very productive. So that was a really fun time. This is my advisor, Dr. Kathy Enzer. And then I got a recent picture of her. I went to the in Informs Conference. That's a conference for uh, operations research that was in Houston, and we got to catch up. And uh, I always also credit her, you know, the seeds that Dr. Faulkner and Dr. Bozeman planted. Somebody had to water them along the way, and she was definitely a person who did that. She would always see me, and she'd be like, hello, future Dr. Williams. And I'd be like, don't lie. Have you seen my R code? It's not compiling. I don't know what the errors are. Like, you don't give out PhDs for that. Um, and so she really also believed in me from the start. I spent some summers at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory as a NASA Wire Scholar, and I got to work in Lonnie Lane's lab. This was my first time doing research. And it was at JPL with this guy. Lonnie was a little short guy. And I remember when I met him, and I'm like, hello, Dr. Lane. And he's like, call me Lonnie. And I was like, well, sir, you know, I'm from where I'm from, you just don't call people, older people that are at least six months older than you. You don't call them by their first name. Like, I have a sign of respect, you know? And so, but at JPL, everybody was on a first name basis. And so I got to work with him on the Europa mission project. Europa is one of Jupiter's moons, believed to be covered in ice. So JPL is currently constructing a little rover to go out melt through the ice and see if there's life underneath. Um, what's beautiful is that this project is actually scheduled to launch in October of next year. So it's amazing to see that something that I worked on <laughs> so long ago uh, is coming to fruition and some of the work that I got to do there. I also spent some time at the National Security Agency. I'd love to tell you what I did, but <laughs> I have to kill you. Nobody wants to die today. So. Uh, working at the NSA was fun because you can't take your work home. So you just, you know, it's all top secret. So you leave and you're like, I don't have anything to do. I can't do work at home. I don't know what they did during COVID because my goodness. Um, I accidentally took a paper home once and I called it in. I was like, oh, I had these papers. I'm so sorry. I'll you know bring it back. And the next day I came in, I pulled up and I gave them my name. And they're like, ma'am, if you can pull over here to the side, please pull right over here. And I was like, oh, I'm about to get shot. You know? <laughs> So I love working there. Uh, a few years ago, I gave a TEDx talk at the Claremont College. One of my students was on the organizing committee and asked if I would uh, give this TEDx talk. And I said no, because I had like three kids under five. I was like, I don't have time to do that. And she was like, Carl Williams, we'd love to have you. I think you'd be good. And, you know, we want to get more students from Harvey Mudd to come. So maybe if we had a Harvey Mudd professor, that was how she sold it. Uh, they would come. And so reluctantly, I agreed. I said, maybe this will help me practice giving a talk that's more public facing, right, instead of research. I asked, what was the topic? She said it was storytelling. And I was like, do you even know what I do? Like a storytelling? God. I'm a statistician. And so uh, out of that was birthed Own Your Body's Data. This TED Talk uh, talks about sort of ways that we can use data that we collect about our bodies to make better health decisions. And um, Half of those 1.9 million views are my mom, because you know she's gonna log in and support her baby every day. Uh, I also got to honor this book, Power in Numbers, that the Rebel Women of Mathematics that features some of the women in this room. This is really sort of the book that I wanted when I was growing up. Because I wanted to, you know, see all the amazing women who've come before me and done cool stuff in math. And uh, as was mentioned, I got to work with PBS, so PBS saw. The, the TED Talk, and they reached out and they said, hey, we've got this idea for a show, a six-part show on some of the biggest questions in science. 
this was really a privilege to work on because growing up, I grew up watching PBS. We were the latchkey generation. We let ourselves in, we fixed ourselves a snack, we sat down, we did homework, and then we watched PBS. Like it was just, you know, self sufficient. We were self sufficient. And so I grew up watching uh, PBS into the evening and Nature and Nova, and, and rarely, if ever, did I see Black scientists featured in the show. And so even though science was something I was excited about, I never could look at the screen and see, and see myself reflected in it. Okay? And so when I met with them to talk about it, they confessed it. They were like, you're right. In the 80s and 90s, we did a great job of telling little white boys that they could be scientists. Because that was the image. We went to all the Ivies and we got the Nobel folks and they all looked the same. And so it was really great to work with um, Rana El Kayubi and Andre Fenton on this because it was really sort of displaying that everybody is a part of STEM and we can all do STEM. Uh, I brought a clip. These were the episodes that we did here. What are animals saying? Are we alone? Are we make life? Is the universe made up? consortium, similar to the AUC, is that we really try to, to get a diverse group of faculty, especially in mathematics, because we want our students to see themselves as mathematicians. And so we're really conscious about the image that we portray and, and wanting our students to identify with our department and see themselves as mathematicians. I want to talk a bit about how I've taken uh, data, the, the work that I do in every day, and made that a part of my life experience. So how it shows up in the classroom, how it shows up in the work that I do. And, um, and it didn't always do that. I didn't always have sort of an equity data-centered mindset in teaching classes. But really after COVID-19, as a statistician, one thing that I learned about COVID-19 was just the, the inordinate amount of data that was now available for public consumption. So some of you may have seen this Johns Hopkins dashboard. They had all the COVID data spatially. You could zoom in, zoom out. You could see real time how many cases they were. You know, how many deaths there were, how many vaccine doses been administered. And so as a statistician, I was excited because people didn't ordinarily share their health data. Like, what's the last time you posted? Like, hey, I just want to get my colonoscopy, you know, everything checked out. But no one says that. With the vaccine, we were all like, yes, I got shot, today. I'm vaccinated, like sharing public health data in a way that we hadn't before. There were also some communities that were not necessarily excited about the vaccine development as it was coming online. Some of you may remember the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. 
And so in speaking with, I would often speak to different organizations, different churches and groups, and a lot of older African Americans were very hesitant to, to take the vaccine. Uh, because they remember what happened in Tuskegee. They remember how the government did an experiment on black men there. And they thought, how is this going to be different? How am I going to trust the government when I couldn't trust them just a few years ago? For those of you that may not know, this is an experiment that started in 1932 that the U.S. government did in Tuskegee, Alabama on uh, black men, 699 of them had syphilis, 200 one of them didn't. And so the goal was to understand how does syphilis propagate and affect the body over time. In 1943, penicillin came out as the drug of choice to treat syphilis that wasn't offered to these men. And so typically, if you experience, if you have something that's better than not doing anything, right? Do no harm, but we all want to improve. So the men were not offered uh, this drug, the scientists decided they wanted to continue to study them despite of them being available. It wasn't until 1972, how many years later is that? 40 years later. So the study started in 32, 1972, a story broke. Associated Press said, what are we doing in Tuskegee? Why do we have men here with syphilis that we haven't treated? Intentionally. Right? Because we don't do people like that. We do we do lab rats like that. We do animals like that, but that's not how we treat people. Right? So this story broke. There was a class action lawsuit the following year that settled for $10 million out of court. There was a formal apology by former President Bill Clinton in 1997. What's so amazing is that it wasn't until 2009 that the last widow passed away. So recently, and children are still getting health benefits and medical benefits from the US government. And so for a lot of folks in the black community, this was fresh on their mind when COVID came out and there was a push to get vaccinated. Some of you may have seen or heard of Dr. Kizmikia Corbett. She was one of the scientists at the forefront of the vaccine development for Moderna. And so she really made it part of her mission to help educate folks in the community, especially the black community, about how this drug was beneficial, but also the part that she played in its development. Here you see her picture with former President Trump and with President Biden. I love this quote where she says, diversity matters for health outcomes for everyone. Because if we're all going to take vaccines, then we all have to be working towards them. I think that's why it's so important, especially for you students, to be in the space. Because as you start to go through life, thinking about how the things that you do are going to affect the entire community around you. and frisk. It's messy, it's online, it's biased. Let's play with that. Let's figure out how to work with this. Reset. For those who may not know, stop question and frisk the policy in New York City where an officer could stop you for any reason they suspected you have a gun or weapon or drug. And what happened when you see the data is that while only 23% roughly of the first population was black, they represent 53% of the top. White Asian Native Americans were 47% of the population, they represent 13%. Latinos were about on par, 29% of the population, 
stops. So my class had to tackle not just the issue of data and give me a histogram and do some hypothesis testing, but do it as it relates to this social issue. And, and then tell me about the issue. Was it fair? Does the data support that it was fair or not? Right. So use your statistical knowledge to then make a concrete decision. It was really interesting to sort of look at some of the things they came up with. This is looking at the number of stops per precinct. So the lighter, the aqua, that's less stops. The deeper, it goes into deep and dark red. Those are more stops. For those of you that may not know New York City, that's sort of the area. There's upper, there's the Bronx, there's Manhattan, up, down to Queens, Brooklyn, and Staten Island, to the left. Are your attention to places in northern Staten Island? has lots and lots of arrests. And notice that that is also the most diverse part of the island. And then also, if you look here in, in the middle here, where it's mostly African-American, you see where stops also concentrate in that area. And so it sort of begged the question, how were people being stopped? Uh, were drugs found? Were more drugs found? Were weapons found? And the, the data does not support that. This was really interesting that we looked at. It's the period of observation. This is how long does an officer look at you before they decide she got a gun? Mm -hmm. I can see it. About a thousand stops, an officer said, I looked at this person for a minute and I decided I got to stop it. Why do you see these peaks at 5, 10, 15? What is that? Right. Like, how long you'll be here? I'll be there in about five minutes. I'm not really five, but it's about. Most people probably weren't looking for five minutes. I mean, like, if we just stopped and stare and, like, you know, I put a fake knife under somebody's table, who is it? In five minutes, we're not going to know anything different. And so the students saw this in the data. They also saw this noise in the data where it's obvious that everybody's not looking for five minutes, but they got to check something off. They don't want to check off one because that sounds like, my goodness, what do I learn from looking at a person for a minute? Um, so this was really not just not just challenging for me because I had to facilitate the conversations. I didn't feel like I was trained. You know, just being a black woman doesn't mean that I'm trained in talking about equity and diversity. And so I had to do some learning as well. One of my students one year was from New York. He was represented twice in the data set. Um, Harvard runs a primarily white institution. So here's this kid from New York City who, this is dating myself. Um, who's a young person? Who's a more recent Steve Urkel looking person? <laughs> he looked like Steve Urkel, but y'all don't know Steve Urkel, right? Uh, well, we do because we're of a certain age, but. For, okay, so who's a young nerdy person? It's like a nerdy. <laughs> I don't want to call somebody out. Like, let me see who it is. <laughs> he looked. He looked like a little nerdy. He was kind of skinny and like smart and and nerdy, like a little nerdy black kid. I don't know how else to say it in a way that's not me. I hope it's not watching. Anyway, so, so he said he was there twice, y'all, twice, and we were just like, for not me. I hope it's not watching. Anyway, so, so he said he was there twice, y'all, twice, and we were just like. For what? Like what in the world? You know, like you could you could pick him up. Like he was just a little black, you know. So um, so we're in class, and, and and so it's this awkward moment, right? Because I'm like, here's this data set, and we're gonna analyze. And he's like, oh yeah. And so I said, well, do you want to share what happened? You know. And so he did. He said, um, well, you know, in New York City. The high schools are all in town, downtown, you know, you can see, we're like, yep, okay, yep, yep, in New York, check, check. He said, so, you know, I was staying after school because I was in the math club. Well, of course, math club, well, that makes sense, <laughs> you know. And um, he said, it was my turn to go get the snacks. We're like, yeah, you got to have snacks if you're going to do math. Hello, like, this is this is all, you know, working out. So he said, he walked to the cafeteria, he got the snacks, he came out, he had two bags, chips, cookies, and he's walking back. 
and police officers pull over and they said, where did you steal that food from? And he's like, oh, no, 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 I'm taking this. This is for the math club. And then they were like, oh, well, now we know you stole it because you that's all you can think of is a math club. And he's like, no, really? I'm going. So, so they followed him to the math club meeting. He walks in and everybody else is looking at him like, why are there two officers? And he's just like, you know, they're like, yeah, he's we're doing the math club. This is so-and-so. He's bringing snacks. Like, oh, OK, OK. All right. Just making sure. And they left. There was no apology. There was no, we're so sorry we really stereotyped you and our assumption was that you must be a thief before you're a mathematician. It was none of that. And so he talked about how traumatizing it was because here are people in authority, you know, he's 17, and here are people in authority who see you as a criminal before they see you as a mathematician. And then even when you say, but I'm a mathematician, you got validated by your peers who were non-Black. There wasn't an adult that came in that said it was like, oh, here's some here are peers that we respect. They say he's supposed to be here, so we we'll let you go this time, you know. So um, so I always share that that story now with my students because I want them to feel connected to it, right? It's like this is these are people in our community who are represented, who are represented. Um, Harvey Mudd had very few black and brown students when I got there in 2008. And so I, I started a conference with girls of color in STEM because I wanted to bring them <laughs> into this environment. And so we started a STEM conference where we bring uh, middle and high school girls to campus. We got featured in Forbes magazine for some of the work that we've done with those girls to just give them a great experience for a whole Saturday and hopefully get them excited about science and math and data science. Uh, every year that we've done it, this is now, I think our 14th or 15th year that we've done this conference, we invite the girls to come. We try to give them a moment where they own the space, where they share something about themselves. This year was, um, what's your inspiration equation? So they had to come up with an equation that, that, that defined them. Like I am, my mom plus my dad squared, you know, minus my brother to the fourth power. Like it was sort of cute to see how they saw themselves. And we also tried to bring in mentors, women who could talk about how they were using math and science and data science and statistics and engineering in their daily life and to inspire them and to talk about the work that they do. The first year that we did the conference, uh, we had students come, girls come, and we, we showed, whisked them off to a great experience. And we told our parents, like, we'll see you at three o'clock. And the parents did exactly what you do. And they sat down, they were like, I'm not leaving my baby girl on this college campus. I don't know. I'm like, I'll be right here. So we had parents who just sat in, in the room and weren't leaving. And I was like, okay, it's great to have you all. Just please don't eat the food because there's not, there's not enough to order food for parents. So from that day, we started doing a parent conference. We started having a, we invited a local, uh, high school guidance counselors to talk to our parents in a separate parent session that mirrored the girl session. And I love this quote uh, from a parent that I most enjoy seeing the excitement and wanting to meet your woman is inside of the crystals of women who are actualizing and practicing their dreams. Um, last thing I'll talk about and open the, the floor for questions or, or sort of a broader engagement, especially with the public. Often when I'm traveling and I'm small talk with somebody on the flight, you know, and they say, well, what do you do? I say, well, I'm a statistician, mathematician. Like, oh my gosh, let me tell you, oh my gosh, let me tell you why I hate math. I remember <laughs> like it was yesterday. And I'm like, why does my job evoke hatred? You know, it's all, nobody's like, I love it. I just love what you do, you know? If I taught English, you'd be like, oh, I hated the day I started speaking. Nobody says that. <laughs> nobody says that, but people hate math. And so I've been excited to try to figure out ways to excite the public and especially to excite more people of color and women about math. And so Zero to Infinity was sort of birthed from that. Zero and infinity, mind-bending ideas. Discover how these concepts revolutionized mathematics. The simplest ideas end up the most influential, the most profound. Whoa! It's the story of nothing. Oh, no, you can learn so much from pizza. <laughs> and everything. It's all one big principle. Zero to infinity. 
on no one. So zero to infinity talks about zero and infinity. Um, we take during COVID, which you can sort of see in this picture to the bottom, uh, folks are masked up. And so we tried to do a lot of taping outside and we really sort of try to uh, take the public to uh, a place where they can sort of understand the birth of zero. That zero wasn't a number when the other numbers came about, it came about later. And so why, why did we find a need for zero? And then also infinity, like helping them understand what is infinity? How do we, um, how do we think about mathematicians? How do you motivate it in a way that the public can understand and get excited about and not turn the TV? Um, here's a clip where we did Zeno's Paradox. And yeah, I'll let it promote itself. Zeno suggested that we consider an error in flight at any instant in time. And at that instant, that now moment, the arrow is frozen in space, motionless. It's neither arriving nor leaving. And if you consider the entire flight, there's an infinity of those motionless, frozen moments in time and space. So Zeno asked, is the flight of the arrow and all motion really just an illusion? His radical conclusion is that motion is impossible. At a given instant, that arrow is someplace. And then click time forward, <laughs> it's at some other place, but at no moment was it moving. Instantaneous velocity. That's Steve Strogatz, who 
who is at uh, Cornell University. He was at MoMath, the Museum of Mathematics in uh, New York, where we got to film that. The other joy about working with Nova and PBS is that they put all these resources online. And so you can see the videos. You can also get support materials for teachers in K-12 and for the classroom. And so it's really great to sort of see this take light into, um, and, and to show up in our, in our schools as well. Uh, the other one I wanted to show you, uh, I got to, to do voiceover for Universe Revealed. Yes. Um, this is really neat because my my kids, we were watching this on Amazon, and they were like, Mommy, why is it starring you? And I was like, I don't know, because I don't show up. There's no face. It's just Talithia uh, doing narration. This was a five-part series with BBC and Nova. And so when they reached out and they were like, we'd like you to narrate it, I was just like, I, my voice just don't sound that good. <laughs> and then uh, in, in the recording studio, so the folks from the UK were on Zoom. And so they get on and they're like, I understand. <laughs> they get on and they're like, hello, Dr. Williams. It, we're just so excited to have you with. And I'm just like, I'm supposed to do narration? And y'all all sound like British and just, you know, beautiful. Um, so this is really fun to do. I think I brought, yes, a clip of that. Uh, so, so this was a really, this whole series is very, it's very picturesque. And so the narration is what carries it because it's really just like a lot of images and it's walking you through the cosmos, the Milky Way, the Big Bang, black holes. And so they were just like, you know, and so I would often do retakes of things because they wanted it to sound a certain way. They're like, Dr. Williams, we need more intrigue. If you can just add intrigue into your voice. So I'm like, what does intrigue sound like? I don't know what intrigue sounds like. Um, this is one of my favorite clips because this was walking back to the moment of the Big Bang. And then it's, and they were like, it's all going to go quiet. And then you're going to say the Big Bang, Dr. Williams. And it's just that your voice is going to, and I was just like, okay, all right, there's no pressure. Um, so I said the Big Bang 83 different times, just, just trying to figure out, like, the Big Bang, the Big Bang, the Big Bang, the Big Bang. Okay, here it is. Astronomers working with the Hubble Space Telescope started to realize that the universe is not just expanding, but it's actually expanding at an ever-increasing rate. It's an accelerator for speeding up stretching that really did catch our community by surprise. We know the universe is expanding, and thanks to Hubble, we got evidence that this expansion is accelerating over time. So if you know the universe is expanding, you can just do a thought experiment and turn time backward and know that the universe was smaller in the past. We can wind back the clock through thousands of billions of yesterdays. back to a time before our Earth and Sun. To a time before the first galaxies. And finally, we can cross the cosmic dark ages to pinpoint the moment the universe began. A moment we know happened 13.8 billion years ago. The Big Bang. an explosion. This is the initial state of the universe which was very hot and very, very dense. Everything, the whole universe was held together in a very tiny region of space. So everywhere in the universe is almost like being inside of a star. All the matter 
that has ever been produced came from that moment. This is really special for me because someone growing up with a Christian faith and seeing in the DNA and reading the scriptures how God created the universe. It was very, uh, it was a really special moment to see from there back to that beginning moment and connect that uh, with the pages. So, um, I'll start in with, with um, you know, I'm often communicating with people from all over when I see things and they'll reach out and everything. And, you know, 99% of it is positive, the other 1% is like, you know what, you know, you did things, you forgot so and so and so and so and you linked to my people. So, it was, it's me to sort of see how people reach out to you. It was an email that I got from Jim. program on zero and infinity. I'm not a mathematician, but as a fellow professor, I was curious as to how one could present something somewhat mundane, zero, and something abstract, infinity, in an interesting way, and I think you were a smashing success. Congratulations on presenting an interesting program. This was a really special one that came uh, from Sarah. She says, hello, I'm the mother of a five-year-old boy with autism. His special interest happens to be numbers and the history of numbers, and we came across Zero to Infinity on PBS. He's watched it about 20 times this week, and he begged me to tell you that he liked you very much, <laughs> and that it must be very fun to have a job where you can be surrounded by so many numbers. <laughs> Wishing you a very Merry Christmas, best dogs, Max in Sweden. Uh, so that was really, really special. Um, I once had a girl reach out to me saying something. She was a fourth grade. And um, he sent an email. She was just like, Hi, Dr. Williams. You know, can I interview you? And uh, I want to dress up as you for Black History Month. <laughs> and I'm like, Zoe, baby, I'm just not old enough. <laughs> Rosa, you know, I mean, I haven't done enough for the, for the community, you know. Um, I haven't reached that echelon yet, you know. And so her mom wrote back, like, Zoe really wants to. I'm like, Catherine Johnson, Zoe, do Catherine. Uh, Ka you know, we can all, you know, be amazed. Um, her mom was like, no, she saw you and she wants to read about you and dress up at you, as you. So we did a Zoom interview and Zoe did her little poster. I said, well, Zoe, honey, I said, what do you know? Where? Because it's not, you know, we don't have white boats. Like, what, what's our professor uniform? And her mom was like, no, no, we got, we got her outfit together. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, so Zoe uh, reached out after Black History Month and shared with me <laughs> her poster and her look, and it was, it was really cute. So um, I'll end there. You know, you never know who you're inspiring with your story, what you can become. I hope you see my life and see that it can easily be a reflection of yours as well, because I was right here where you were just a few years ago. So thank you so much. Yeah. 
sort of anecdotal because I'm looking at y'all to see how you respond. And so when people sort of laugh or they nod, it's kind of how I can tell. You can also tell when people look confused if they didn't get something. And so I think in, in my role as a professor, I'm used to, to gauging my students by looking at their faces and seeing when they're like, you know. And I think that's also true in, in storytelling. You can see when people are with you. And then when people, when you've lost people, when they start going to their phones and, you know, when heads go down, yeah, you kind of read the room. I like that question. Yes. statistics than necessarily calculus and integration. 
My boys are taking it though, so I'll do it. I'm just saying. Yes. So is it possible to know more about your NASA experience? Because I'm actually very fascinated about NASA. Yeah. And I'm still choosing like which career path to take since like kind of like everything. So to know more about like a physics and mathematics side would actually be beneficial. Yeah, more about my NASA experience. Uh, in a nutshell, because we can talk right after, it was amazing. Uh, at NASA, what I loved about it is that everything is collaborative. So we'd sit around the table and you brought your specialty to the table, right? So there's a structural engineer, there's a biologist who's gonna determine you know, how we do the samples. Um, there's a mechanical engineer that's building the probe. And so you really sort of plug into this team where you, you see everything come together in a way that you often don't when you're just siloed in your field. And so I, I love that time, but we can talk more offline, but it was great. I, I saw another hand. Yes. Hello, man. My name is Shayla Shree. Um, I'm a junior at West Point and studying data science. So my question is, how do you have or encourage your students to transition from just studying uh, equity-driven data to actually trying to use data to create solutions and like, using what you're learning in your classroom to impact policy? Yeah, that's a great question. How do I help my students transition from just doing data in class to like doing it in life? Uh, one thing that I encourage them to do is hackathons. And so hackathons are a great way to sort of take what you've learned in practice and then put it to work in a real life situation so that you can see how that works. At Harvey Mudd, we have clinics where uh, companies sponsor, sponsor research programs and research experiences for our, our seniors. And so I often partner with nonprofits to get social justice oriented clinics where students are working on projects that affect, you know, either social justice or equity. And so there are ways that I've tried to sort of give my students that experience where they can take what they've learned and then put it into practice. Yeah. Yes. Hey, Yeah, that's such a great, great question. Um, I, I will say for my black students at 